Guten Morgen, everybody. I'm pretty sure I butchered that, but it's also currywurst time. Well, that's for everyone in Berlin, including Jaime Rivera, who is not on the show today because he's out gallivanting at IFA in Berlin. But here in North America, we're left to be content discussing the nine, yes, nine phones that launched at IFA. And most of them came out even before IFA officially began. It's kind of par for the course, but we have all of that news for you in this show. Does BlackBerry hold an icon that everybody wants? Is Honor playing in the big leagues now? Is HTC shrinking away from us further? Does an Android One push make sense for LG and Motorola? How does Sony do with its first OLED mobile phone? And is there vengeance for ZTE after months of dormancy? There is so much to cover on this week's IFA-centric show. We have specs and a few bits of other info for all of these phones, so let's go ahead and talk about it on this, the Pocket Now Weekly. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 320, brought to you by Pocket Now and XDA developers on this day, Friday, the last day of August, actually, 2018. From smartphones to tablets to wearables and so much more, we're talking about all of the stuff that you wish you had when you were a kid. So let's go ahead and get talking. I am your host for the weekly. It is Joshua Vergara. What's going on, everybody? Uh, and we have a couple of uh, new faces on the show, at least new for me in a way. Uh, but in place of Jaime Rivera, who is out in Berlin, uh, and also Brandon Miniman, who has the day off, we have a couple of our friends from XDA. We're going to start off with creative director Mario Serafero. Can you tell me if I pronounce that correctly? <laughs> That's fine. It, <laughs> nobody can figure it out in the US. It's fine. Fair enough. Um, now, right when I got into the call before we hit the hit record on the live uh, live stream here, you guys were talking. You and Jules were talking about a little story that we'll talk about later. But why don't you show our fans, <laughs> our listeners, uh, and viewers? Yeah, I might be the first person to have a broken S Pen like this. Oh my goodness! You can tell that it's uh, <laughs> that that chromey bit. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, had a lady over. She put a bunch of crap on her on my nightstand. Uh, I subconsciously try to put my phone back on the nightstand at 2 a.m. after some texting, and I couldn't find room for it, so it just fell. And I'm like, okay, I have a case on it, no big deal. Now, everyone that knows uh, Samsung Galaxy Note phones knows that when the phone falls, the S-Pen just ejects. Just the loss of physics always makes it just shoot out, the S-Pen shoots up. Okay, fine. I inspect the phone, no big deal, I can't find the S-Pen. Okay, where's the S Pen? And then I shine the flashlight and I see the chromey bit. I'm like, oh no. Uh, and then I pick it up. And I start <laughs> and I start cursing, just like cursing, ah. and cursing, and cursing. And that didn't help things. No. At all. <laughs> you can doesn't. imagine. Um uh, have you posted this to uh the tech gore subreddit yet? Uh, no, I haven't. I haven't. It's it all too should. it's too sudden, you know. I'm still mourning. <laughs> uh, still mourning. Yeah. I, I did make a very just one day delivery order. For another one um, that's fifty bucks down the drain, plus the expedited sh shipping. Um, so, yep, it's av it's available on Samsung's website now. You could buy it separately. Uh, I bought it through Amazon. So, oh, gotcha. Okay, yeah. Well, we will we will pour one out. I mean, I don't have tea today because we're kind of in a hurry, but I'll pour a little bit of out for the S Pen. <laughs> yeah. uh, but in any case, we can also move over to our senior editor, Steven Zimmerman. And uh, Jules usually makes a script for me to be able to follow. And it says here, what's good in the GTA? And I learned something today. You can tell our viewer, Steven. <laughs> uh, yes, it's pretty good in Toronto. It's uh, starting to get a little bit chill chillier. It's no longer 30 something degrees out, but uh, it's still it's still nice out. The greater Toronto area. I've never heard that before, but when I go see my family in Toronto, I'm definitely going to say that from now on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to take that trip up the Don Valley Parkway. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And you were just hearing our podcast wrangler and the man in the production booth, Jules Wong. How's it going, Jules? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing good in the greater Boston area or um, <laughs> Bean Town, the GPA. Um, <laughs> It's the best, the hub of the universe. Call that. <laughs> well, Jules, I have to. My hats off to you. Like uh, we we do our best to put together a great show every single week. And Jules, you had a lot of work ahead of you this week, so we're gonna go ahead and just jump right into it. Yeah, we have a boy. lot of stories out of Eva, and we're going to start can, off. Can with I back Eva. out? Can I like? Can I just get out of this show? <laughs> Like I, I'm not prepared actually for my for my head and my heart. It's just not I, like I'm, my doctor has uh, given me a note. I kind of am not prepared either. This is the first IFA that I am not at in like 
probably five, six years. It's it's kind of a bittersweet thing because, I mean, just on a personal level, I'm, I have nothing against IFA or Berlin or anything like that. But in, in the grand scheme of all of the shows throughout the year, I mean, I, I told myself if I don't have to go to IFA, then I'll be okay. It's cool. Like, I'm not going to really worry over it. But I will admit, all of the photos that Jaime has been showing over on his IG and his IG stories, and and then all of these announcements, I got a, I got, I got a, bit, I got a teeny bit of the FOMO going right now. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll start off with one of the many device announcements that happened. We're starting off with the BlackBerry Key 2 LE. Now, LE, we originally thought it might be called light. LE could mean limited edition. And it certainly feels like it because there are a few new colors of the BlackBerry Key 2. Let's run through the specs real quick. It does rock the Snapdragon 636. Uh, it still has the 4.5 inch screen at 1080p resolution, four gigabytes of RAM, though we would love to see a six gigabyte RAM edition one day in the future. Um, the battery is 3000 milliamp hours with quick charge 3.0, and apparently it's out now. It's available on August 30th, as it says on the Pocket Now website. You can head over to see that story at pocketnow.com. Well, well, it, it's uh, to be. Uh, it was announced uh, yesterday, uh, and it will launch within the next month. So, ah, not to mislead our viewers here or listeners. There we go. Well, I, I've already sent in my email to them, and I said, bring that red one over right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, fellas, how do you feel about the BlackBerry Key 2 LE? Hmm. Well. I certainly think it's more limited, uh, perhaps not as in like limited edition terms. Uh, <laughs> there, there are many downgrades to it that um, almost make me sad because there are many things that I liked about the BlackBerry Key One line, and this kind of robs it of its executive feel by opting for plastic. And then the removal of the capacitive scrolling on the keyboard, that's like a signature feature of this mm. new kind of a, a revived <clears throat> form factor, right? Um, and then the battery downgrade, which, you know, the key one is known for legendary battery life. So it, 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 it seems kind of a bit too limited, if you ask me. Okay. How about you over there, Steven? Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, they definitely took a couple things and stepped down in the right spot spaces. Like the 636 instead of the 660 is a completely reasonable downgrade. It's honestly not much of a downgrade to, to at all. Uh, mm -hmm. But they definitely did go overboard in certain areas. It almost feels like it should be branded as a different brand, not to dilute the key one name. Right. Um, the lack of that battery is really going to have an impact on how it's used, how it's received. And yeah. hopefully it doesn't uh, knock it down too much. Mario, you mentioned the uh, the loss of the executive feel. Like, Do you think the colors uh, also contribute to that a little bit? Or are you jazzed about the colors? So... I'm kind of jazzed because I actually really, really like red phones. Like yeah. I was begging OnePlus to release a red phone. And then when they released uh, the red 5T, I was like, oh my God, this is everything I wanted. And now they continue that with the uh, red OnePlus 6, which is also beautiful. Uh, for this though, I almost feel like it doesn't quite match. It kind of reminds me of like the approach that BlackBerry had in countries like, uh, in countries of Latin America, where I would see blackberries all the time and it would be like the cheaper blackberries not like the executive looking blackberries but like the the cheaper more plasticky ones that everyone had because they were cheaper so it, mm. it seems kind of that they they went back to the okay we want this uh semi high-end but not really executive phone and now we're also releasing these cheaper ones that are more accessible more colorful have kind of more of a broader appeal but also yeah. in the process they loosen a little bit of that uh, special yeah, I agree. I, I I I do think that there's a little bit to be uh, desired with these phones, but I think that was kind of the point. I mean, after all, Jules, um, any thoughts on the three hundred and ninety nine dollar price point? After all, yeah, that's going to be a little bit more convincing for people who are kind of normal, but also do want that uh, nostalgic BlackBerry uh, keyboard. Uh, some of the features, as you've said, have been taken away, like the capacitive scrolling. But I don't think. Um, if you know it's not a feature that was lost to many of the customers that would be would want to uh, you know if they're uh, approaching blackberry again for the first time in many years or if they're just approaching it from an all new point that is uh, going to be something that they won't miss and i feel like uh, in terms of what the spec combination provides here um it's not much of a step down for the price that you know the we got a 649 for the key two and this takes it down to 
four forty nine if you really want to be, uh, you know, uh, well stocked. I guess yeah. you could say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also, I didn't know that there was so much uh, Pokemon Go favoris, uh, favoritism in here in terms of a uh, team Valor. If we're going by the <laughs> colors, red, yellow, and blue. I don't know, maybe <laughs> instinct may have been my color here. Oh yeah, fair enough. Um, I I think it's an honorable play from a BlackBerry, and uh, did you, you just know, to be wait wait wait? Hey, did you... You, let me have my segues. <laughs> 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 I think it's an honorable play by BlackBerry to create a version of their latest phone that is accessible to as many people as possible, even if they have to cut things down a little bit. The price gets cut down too, which is which is probably the right thing for them to do in order to get um, into more hands. Speaking of honorable plays. <laughs> <laughs> we have also the Honor Play was announced at IFA. Now, what we have here is another phone trying to blast into the gaming segment. And as this advertisement, as you're probably seeing on the live version right now, it says it's crazy fast and crazy smart. Uh, now, the Kirin 970 is the processor, but it comes with something called GPU Turbo. Now, my favorite part about <laughs> the way the Honor Play was sort of marketed is that obviously Samsung was using Fortnite as their game in order to market the Galaxy Note 9. Uh, but in this case, uh, they've gone ahead and gone for the complete uh, other side of things with the competitor. And now this is the phone if you want to play PUBG Mobile, yeah. <laughs> which is pretty hilarious. And I think it's really awesome. Um, one thing I do like about this phone, though, is that uh, Honor claims that you can go for a whole season of a TV show. I wish that they said what TV show that might be. <laughs> but apparently, the battery is going to be able to last for quite a while. Gaming segment phones, and now we have the Honor Play in the mix. How do we feel about the Honor Play, you guys? Um, I still don't know what GPU Turbo is. I've, yeah, I've, <laughs> I've messaged people from Honor. I've asked for a white paper. Uh, they've sent me just a bunch of slides, so it's just like a rehash PowerPoint that didn't really teach me anything. Mm. Um, that said, there are some improvements um, when you actually get down and test it. Uh, the 970 is a very capable chip, and this is more of an affordable device, as Honor devices typically are. So it's actually mm -hmm. really, you know, it's a compelling package. It's interesting that they're using PUBG uh, to advertise that it. it's, it's actually very interesting. And, like, I see that <clears throat> Fortnite and PUBG, they're both being just used by everyone trying to push a gaming for and a phone that can do gaming. They all feature in their marketing material and stuff. Um, it seems like a very compelling package and at, at a good price big battery big screen uh powerful specs uh it's you know it the, the 980 is coming really soon so having yeah. a 970 at the end of the cycle is perhaps not ideal um but still for the price it's it's actually really compelling still it's one of those moves that helps the phone stay as affordable as possible. But I right. wonder if that the desire to keep an Honor phone affordable kind of cuts it at the knees. Because, for example, and I'm asking you, Stephen and Jules, about this. Um, do you think that for a phone that's trying to have PUBG Mobile as its marquee video game, you have the 970, which is fine. But then is it cutting itself at the knees by having something like 4 gigabytes of RAM, only 64 gigabytes of storage? Because these games that they're hoping to use um, require a lot of RAM, and they also require a lot of storage. Storage space. I mean, what do you guys think? Oh, there you go. <laughs> it definitely is some. Uh, it definitely is a bit of a disappointment from uh, if you're hoping to have high resolution games with high resolution graphics. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you're do if you're locked into one application, you're not really going to be pushing up to six gigabytes quite yet. You still can make by with um, four gigabytes, four gigabits of RAM. Or, Gigabytes of RAM, gigabits would not be enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I, I think they'll actually be okay with four gigabytes. I just um, I'm more concerned about the battery. The 3750 is big, but it's not massive for the screen size. For a similar screen size, and for that GPU, that, yeah, it's a very uh, powerful GPU. Very powerful GPU. It could be quite the battery drainer. Yep. I know they said uh, that they'd have um, the ability to watch a full season's worth of a show, but that's not <laughs> really GPU heavy. That's <laughs> that's the encoding. Right. And yeah, again, that's true. Show. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, that's true. It, yeah, what show are they it, talking about? Is it Lost, or is it like first season <laughs> of The Walking Dead, which is like eight mini episodes, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. Or Sherlock, something like that. Um, one thing I find interesting here is that there's uh, there's there's this feature that they have, the 4D Smart Shock, kind of like the uh, HD Rumble on a Switch, 
yeah. in a way. Yeah. Well, what what does this even add to? Like games are not necessarily tailored for a vibration feedback to begin with. So what would right. this even do for you? Well, I mean, <laughs> even with the the need to have this sort of haptic feedback, that's going to take up more of that battery to uh, yeah. you know just keep that going. Yeah. So, and with the pub, I, like, what else is it going to work with? Just PUBG, which uh, I'm sorry that you couldn't get the Fortnite partnership, but hey, I think that's not really <laughs> the way to react with that. Um, yeah. But yeah, like um, I find it kind of uh, doubtful. I don't think it is necessary it's i'd really have to have it in my hands to test it out because yeah. if it's not approached in a thoughtful way then it's just going to feel like some random shaking is happening and or maybe it's going to be no i'm going to really hate this but it's like when you're winning if you have the rumble pack on or you're winning mario kart and then you get first place and then just starts continuously shaking for like <laughs> 10 minutes after you win it's like yeah, that's um, that's a pretty funny situation. Um, now, one thing that I I do want to uh, touch upon before we go into our next topic, um, Honor has a pretty strong foothold in Amazon, and apparently, this phone we have no information as to whether or not this phone is even coming to America. Um, personally, again, I think they're cutting themselves at the knees because Honor is one of those sought after phones because of its affordable price point on Amazon, yet we're not getting the Honor Play. I mean, PUBG Mobile, this is where PUBG Mobile lives here in the US. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a little bit worried about that. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and move on to a, yet another company who announced uh, another version of their flagship device, a little bit like the way BlackBerry did. HTC has announced, uh, it is now official, the U12 Life. Now, Naming conventions aside, HTC does like to use the word life quite a lot. And usually this means that it is the lower tiered version of the uh, flagship device. So what we have here is an FHD plus six inch display at 18 by nine aspect ratio. And this time the Snapdragon 636, uh, just like in the uh, key two. Uh, it also has four or six gigabytes of RAM, however, and also comes in storage variations of 64 to 128. Uh, the rear camera uh, is a duo 16 megapixel and five megapixel pixel shooter at f 2.0 aperture and the battery has a uh, 3600 milliamp hours in its capacity now there is one thing that a lot of people have touched upon when it comes to this phone and all of the videos i've seen coming out of ifa the fact that it looks very pixel like <laughs> yeah it's got that two-tone back and uh, i don't even know is that glass at the top i'm trying it's, to it's acrylic glass yeah ah acrylic glass shiny, okay acrylic glass HTC did like not really they, they didn't develop or manufacture i don't think that's the word but didn't they sort of build the original pixel so it kind of makes sense mm -hmm. that they have uh this design aspect coming in um yeah. did any of you guys use the life phones from htc over the last couple of years mm -hmm. no. nope no. There's... it was available at t-mobile and direct from htc yeah okay they're surprisingly reliable i have to say like it's it's one of those phones really? that because of because of generally of the price point like um, right now we have european prices at 329 and 349 but if that translates to america that's a pretty good price and you know what for the performance i got out of the u11 six, six gigs of ram for 349 euros like there come on please exactly that's amazing <laughs> this but, is uh, <laughs> fair but there here's the question though like um where where is HTC like in the echelon of in the in the vast spectrum of smartphone companies? Where does HTC land with you guys? Because this is this is a question that I've heard asked many times. Everyone has different opinions, and now we have HTC still making phones out IFA. Um, how do how where where do you how, where do you land on HTC right now? Hmm. Um, well, Stephen and I are big fans of the HTC Ten. Uh, we both oh, used yeah. that phone for a while. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know what Stephen thinks. I've personally grown really disillusioned with uh, HTC. They've kind of moved away from some of the things that I liked most about their designs. And um, uh, that said, if if I were to judge the U12, the U12 live in a life in a vacuum, uh, it looks really nice. Like it's got that pixel aesthetic, but it's got this shiny uh, glass cover. Mm -hmm. And I, my only disappointment is that it no, it's not a, an Android One device. I think it would be a perfect Android One device. You know, I've been hearing that a lot lately. Android One not being on on quote unquote affordable devices. I guess they're synonymous in a certain type of way. But I, I've heard a lot of people say that if if Android One's not at the helm of it, then it's kind of you know it's, it's a bit of a loss. It's an interesting yeah. uh, perspective I've been hearing a lot lately. Stephen, any thoughts on HTC or the U12 or the U12 Life? Well, I mean, the problem there is just people are worried about updates. 
uh, people don't want to be stuck mm. on some old software version without the latest features, without the latest ability to play all the um, whatever apps or anything that requires a new version. It's it's a bit disappointing to see a low-end device that normally wouldn't get updates uh, not be on Android 1 where it might have gotten updates. Right. Um, Fair enough, Fair enough yeah. And HC's also been, as Mario was saying, HC's been taking a bit of a step back in some ways from what they were doing before. Um, even with HD 10, which I, I use until the battery died, um, there was there were things from the HD M9 that I missed. It didn't have the um, motion, the, je- the gesture to um, turn on the camera by just holding the volume button and turning it. It didn't have certain features, and it feels like they were replacing a lot of those very useful features with things that um, don't really have the same usability. You don't yeah. like squeezing your phones? <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine if you were able to squeeze the HTC 10 with those sharp edges? <laughs> oh. oh, no. <laughs> yeah, those, those chamfer edges, you just... They, they, the HTC 10 had, like, the biggest chamfer of all time, too. Oh, for sure. Yeah, you, I, you can't we, call them chamfers. They're bevels. They're, they are <laughs> full-on bevels. Speaking of which, the uh, uh, back in our chat for this live, uh, there are a few people who agree that the HTC 10 is a very fondly remembered device. Um, Goran Petrovic, my 10 is still fine, battery replaced, two more years, easy. Um, we also have Ten Hud saying that the M8, he had the M8 rather, and misses the boom sound speakers. I kind of agree with that, to be honest. Yeah, yeah um, I remember the first time I heard the boom sound speakers. I was at the park and I heard this very loud music and I thought that someone was carrying an actual boom box. But then I realized mm. it just came from a tiny phone. I'm like, oh, <laughs> it actually does work. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. What was, what was the mid-range version of their phones back then in the M series? It was like the M8 Mini? Not Mini. Minis. Yeah. And they, and they and were the really watered down. They had the Plus. The pluses. They, had they had the Mini, the, the Plus, or the Max. The, the one, the one Max the was the most interesting yeah. one. Yeah. And yeah, the eye. Also, and, the, uh, and then they I had the too desire. many versions. Too many versions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Oh gosh. All right. So um, as is the as is the, sort of the trend at EFA right now, what we have are variations of already existing devices, and LG is continuing that trend with two G7 variants. Now, the first one is called the LG G7 One. <laughs> which is an Android One smartphone, so there's Android One coming back. This one, however, is powered by the Snapdragon 835, has four gigabytes of RAM and 32 gigabytes of storage. Uh, it also has a Quad HD Plus display, that 16 megapixel shooter on the rear, and is powered by a 3,000 milliamp hour battery. Also, even though it is an Android One device, it still has all of the features you would want out of a G7, apparently, with the mil spec and also a Quad DAC. Even has an FM tuner. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> for uh, for an Android One device, it's pretty beefed up. And then the other one is the G7 Fit, which when I heard this name, I thought, okay, I wonder what we're, where we're going with this. It's powered by the Snapdragon 821, has the same amount of RAM, uh, a 64 gigabyte version, and uh, it doesn't really change the fact that they are identical in size. Um, what do we the fit? Does fit mean mid range? Is like is that what we're going for here? Yeah. I'm- a little confused by that. Normally, yeah. the Fit devices or something like that are the super durable, extra water resistance devices like yeah. the uh, Samsung S Active series. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I, the thing that confuses me the most about it, though, is the processor. Why yeah. the 21? Do they have that many left over? The 700 series <laughs> would probably be a better option at this point if you're choosing a processor from scratch. So why the 821? Remind yeah. me real quick is the 821 the one that kept overheating, or is it a 20? It is the 810. Oh, it's 10. That was the yeah. 10. Okay. Yeah, maybe they do just have a lot left over. Who knows? <laughs> but um, calling something the G7 Fit, it's just really, it's weird. And that 64 gigabyte version is a Fit Plus. And it seems like they're really, they're, they're missing the market in terms of people who want like a, a rugged active phone in a way. So maybe it could have so, been plastic. You know? mm, so you know what my speculation is on this is that, okay, so they launched the LG G6 with the Snapdragon 821 because Samsung was hogging all of the 8 35s for its uh, Galaxy S8. Yeah, that's the, I think that was it. Um, and uh, they basically, but they, they were like the last ones because like they were like the phone, the chipset launched all the way back last year and it was coming to the end of its like mainstream life in April, which was when the LG G6 launched. So Qualcomm was probably, probably like, hey, we have like, 20 million units left, um, have them all at this very discounted rate. Thanks very much. So I feel like that was like the the period 
for uh, Qualcomm and just LG is like, okay, what do we have to do with these? Yeah, in a way, yeah. And uh, uh, Mario, any thoughts on the Android One edition in this case? I think it's great. I think it might be the best Android One phone out there, actually. Um, I, like the Android One has been relegated to mid-rangers, but if you look at the A35, that's still a very capable chip that's more oh, totally. powerful than any mid-ranger that I've seen in an Android One phone. And you get the premium design, you get the LG features. It really depends uh, whether they market this as a flagship or a cheap flagship or like an expensive mid-ranger. If it was an expensive mid-ranger as opposed to a flagship of any of the denomination, I think that would be a, a good package because you get like my main issue with LG is always the software. So having uh, a, a, an Android One phone and perhaps perhaps just better updates because their update center hasn't done anything. They they they've just talked the talk. They never walk the walk. So it could remedy some of my biggest problems with LG if it's done right. So I'm actually, I actually like it. Even with the outdated processor, it doesn't really matter to me that much. Well, there's always that software question, but uh, I think there's a good toss up in our chat here from DJ Johns. I am commenting this on a G7 right now. Does that mean that we should expect ROMs that allow us to flash Android One's firmware on existing G7s? I think that might be a little bit of a stretch, but um, if any of you want to take that. That's um, a hell of an idea, I think. Yeah. I, I don't see why not. Actually, I mean, if I mean, if you uh, if your phone's treble enabled, and if you get one of those G7s, the lucky ones are bootloader unlockable. Uh, truth be told, I haven't kept mm. track with LG's bootloader unlocking stuff just because it's been a mess for so long. Um, I possibly, yeah. You just follow the thread, uh, follow the the forum of your device, and hope for the best, and maybe ask around and see if anyone's considering developing that. They probably really should have gone for a different name other than Fit. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. mm -hmm. That's really the one thing I'm thinking here. But I will give LG a little bit of credit. If this is their ploy to move away from the ThinQ weirdness, then maybe that maybe that's OK. Can you imagine if this was the LG G7 ThinQ one? <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, God. Oh, now, no. speaking, speaking of the term one being used in a lot of places, apparently now we're going to have the Motorola One. All right, so um, after the introduction of China-exclusive Motorola P30, um, the international and global version was supposed to be the conversation moving forward, and apparently the Motorola One may be the answer to that question. Now, it doesn't contain too many of the specifications, uh, but what we have here is basically a 4 gigabyte of RAM phone with the Snapdragon 625. Um, expandable storage at 64 gigabytes, uh, 3,000 milliamp hour battery along with Motorola's turbo power charging, which is always nice. Dual camera system, something we're going to expect pretty much in any phone moving forward, even when they are um, mid-rangers for the most part. Uh, 13 megapixels with a 2 megapixel secondary. Uh, headphone jack, which is awesome. And it is Android One, even though it comes with the uh, uh, version 8.1. Now, there is another version of this, the Motorola One Power. Uh, Power! Right <laughs> yeah. The Motorola One Power does have upgraded specifications. This time it has the now common, at least at IFA, Snapdragon 636. Um, has the 4,850 milliamp hour. Let me say that again. 4,850 milliamp hour battery, <laughs> for goodness <laughs> sakes. Um, it does get updated cameras, uh, but however, this is not fully, fully confirmed yet, but it has a 16 megapixel with a 5 megapixel secondary rear camera and a 12 megapixel front. Okay, maybe the main story here is the fact that the Motorola One Power even exists with that Thick old battery. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, like he's supposed to have the day off today, but freaking Brandon Miniman uh, just <laughs> dropped into our chat. Uh, I think the design of the Moto One Power looks gangsta. Plus, huge battery, <laughs> double hearts uh, over there. So yeah, like um, there's a great combination going on with the Moto One Power. Um, does that mean it automatically gets the buy recommendation over the Moto One? Hmm. Well. The Moto One is using a very crusty processor at this point. I, the 625 just keeps proving that it just won't die. Um, and it's interesting. <laughs> well, it's, it just won't die for a reason because of that, you know, reputation for it being That's a battery true. sipper. That's true. It is a battery sipper. But, I mean, it is a battery sipper just because it's got a, an all-power-efficient core configuration, which 
at this point, you know, we've, we've moved in a manufacturing process and we have the A55, which is a step up. Um, that said, it's nice that uh, I, I like I like that it's sporting such a nice glass design and a notch screen, which, you know, love it or hate it, it is kind of a, a premium feature, or at least it was a few months ago, um, at a very affordable price. It's almost very weird to me that there's such a design disparity between the two phones. That one is glass, has the outdated processor, and that has a newer processor, but it's like metal and more like rugged or, or thicker and uh, beefier. Um, I think they're both okay. I think that the price might be a little bit higher, uh, considering that specs wise, it kind of cannibalizes their Moto G line a bit. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, it, it depends whether they want to target the Moto G people and try to lure them with nicer designs, even though the last Moto Gs had very nice designs too. Yeah, um, Stephen, do uh, how do you feel about Moto's direction, especially under Lenovo? Like for anybody, quick shameless plug, I did do a Moto Z3 review here at Pocket Now, so make sure you check that out. But one of the one of the points I made in that video is that Moto definitely doesn't seem like the company we remember back in the X days. Um, so, Stephen, how do you feel about now the Motorola One being the latest step in that direction? To be honest, it seems a little bit like they're trying to find themselves again. They've uh, they're trying a whole bunch of different tactics. They've got the One line. They've got the G line doing some different things. They brought the X line back for a little bit. They're trying out to see what they can do with the uh, add-on batteries and stuff with the X, with the Z line. They're going all these different directions. It doesn't seem to have one unified um, path to it. Hopefully, they'll find a good path forward because I've loved some of their advice in the past. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure which direction they're going to end up settling in. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm a little bit skeptical myself because um, Motorola One, the way that it looks, the way that it feels, just sort of like the general feel behind it all. It does. It feels less Moto and more Lenovo than anything else. And I remember when uh, Moto was um, when they were. <clears throat> Excuse me. When they were acquired by Lenovo, I kept thinking to myself, Motorola is what we're going to get in the U.S. Lenovo is going to be what we get everywhere else. But it just kind of, yeah. eh. <laughs> it doesn't seem like that's been the case anymore. <laughs> um, all right. So, oh, sorry. Go for it. I am a little curious about the uh, one power, though. I'm really wondering how thick the device ends up being with that battery. Because we, mm. we've seen some ones that end up actually not being that, cr I mean, you, you'd expect it to be thicker with a larger battery. But we've seen quite a few times where some of the really massive battery phones end up being only like 11, 12 millimeters thick. Um, so I'm, I'm curious what it'll end up being that way, because I haven't seen any hard specs for that yet. True. Um, I, I, I just got a funny image in my head of somebody just holding like a power bank and oh, this is my phone. <laughs> like there's not, <laughs> there's not even a screen on it, just a battery. Oh boy. Okay. So from Motorola, we move into Sony and Sony always uses IFA as a, as a wonderful place to just announce some new phones, whether or not they actually make it to a lot of markets remains to be seen half the time because Sony likes to like change up the phones a little bit when it comes to the carriers in the US. So we don't know what's going to happen with this particular phone. This is the XZ3. Also naming conventions be damned. We have the XZ3 right now. <laughs> um, this is this is without a shadow of a doubt a flagship level device, the Snapdragon 845, a quad HD plus display with the triluminous and the X reality mobile display technologies underneath. You have four gigabytes. Yeah, I believe this is their first uh, OLED, uh, Bravia OLED uh, device. Oh, it's an OLED, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So, All right, wait cool. a second. It's triluminous and it's POLED, so it's probably R uh, RBGB. Doesn't mm -hmm. triluminous re refer to the three colors that they're using per pixel on LCD? Subpixel, I'm not sure, actually. Uh, yeah, okay. Especially, yeah. as, like, oh. I, well, that, I think it's just really branding. Yeah. Um, I, Crop show, yeah. just like this uh, stuttery uh, midpoint that I'm just exacerbating for uh, dramatic effect. Yeah, it seems like they just forgot what the branding came from originally, and they're just continuing to use it, even though it's yeah not relevant anymore. Yeah, that's true. Well, one of the one of the interesting things with this latest uh, Xperia device, and and I think uh, I think it was Jaime who said uh, he predicted it, and he was right that the latest Xperia phone that would be announced would not have that that massive forty eight megapixel sensor. You know, in this case, yeah. we have the rear uh, nineteen megapixel 19. motion eye. So, um, where would we where where might we see that next uh, IMX sensor? I mean, I'm, I'm just wondering where that might end up going. We might not see the phone. It might be, and it might end up being used in a different uh, type of device. That's and just never. It may never, may, may <clears throat> never actually end up seeing 
usage in phones. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They, they do sell Maybe. their cameras to other, uh, they, they sell them for security cameras. They sell them for a whole bunch of other applications. Um, mm. the, it'll be interesting to see what ends up happening with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had the what? What was that? The uh, the four K display on one of the previous Xperia's, and that kind of didn't go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. I mean, do do, do current? I, I'm I'm not. You are you are ISP guy. So would would the Spectra even be able to handle that much resolution? Um, I'm actually not sure. I, I think it should be able to handle it, but you may not be able to do really fast bursts or anything like that. Right. It may require downsampling, like the Sony's used to back in the Z3 days. Yeah. Um, so, I'm, so I'm go. just for um, to clear things up here, the Snapdragon 845 has dual 14-bit ISPs and uh, support for a 16 megapixel. Oh, so that's a uh, photo, uh, 32 megapixel single camera. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's that. You know, that's often a there. There are often some bottlenecks that people don't associate with the sensors themselves, such as uh, data transfer speeds or uh, uh, like. Lately, they've been doing embedded memory on the sensor itself. So there's like also like those processing limitations that sometimes hold back these new technologies of generation. Even if you get like a uh, much better, uh, say, uh, frame rate on a new sensor, frame rate capabilities, or if you get uh, much higher resolution or whatnot, sometimes it's it's got to wait a little bit for the ISPs to catch up. Mm. Well, hopefully we see that sensor coming at some point, whether or not it's in a Sony phone. A um, couple of questions in our chat real quick. Is the XZ3 water resistant? Indeed it is. Uh, it has IP65 or 68 ratings. Um, and also, I saw one here just a second ago. Okay, Sean Vega Valez, I'm not uh, Velez, I'm not going to actually say what the comment was, but it was commenting on the uh, the look <laughs> of the phone. And I kind of just wanted to, I wanted to give a, just one thought, like, Okay, Xperia phones, they, they tend to have very similar designs from year to year. This one kind of looks, I've seen this before. The one thing that I have to comment on, that fingerprint reader looks kind of low, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. yeah, very low. Yeah, yeah. I, I have no idea what the uh, what the, uh, the the thought was there from Sony to put it so low. Because mm-hmm. this is gonna this is gonna result in more drop phones than anything else. <laughs> yeah, Wait, I think all right. Lower than actually more smudged but... cameras too. Because oh, like yeah. subconsciously, I would. That's where I would put my finger. You want to look my phone. <laughs> on the camera lens? <laughs> that's true. I think it actually might be higher than it looks. I think it's just really tall phones make you look extra low. But it it definitely is a bit low even then. Yeah, but even then, yeah. it's like at the center of gravity of the phone. So so even if you hold the phone kind of like center a little bit, you have to do some. Adjust- why am I still holding this? You have to do some adjustment. <laughs> <laughs> um, Still holding that ass pen. You yeah. see, just can't let go, man. Just can't let go. Can't let go. No. I have a feeling. I have a feeling that the engineers over at Sony were like, "This is where the balance is. That's where the <laughs> <laughs> the, the omni balance." Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's where the fingerprint reader will go. <laughs> oh boy. All right. So mm. a name, a name in the smartphone game that you may not have heard a whole lot for a little bit is ZTE. Now we have the Exxon 9 Pro. And as uh, Anton wrote here at Pocket Now, it's supposed to be a true multimedia flagship. So we have a full HD plus display. Take that for what you will if you're looking at a multimedia phone. Uh, but it does have the Snapdragon 845, 6 gigabytes of RAM, 128 gigabytes of onboard storage, and that panel is an AMOLED display. Uh, so what we're looking at here is ZTE's return. But of course, the number one question here is how do they bounce back from all of the controversy that happened Especially here in North America, um, is this going to is this going to do it for them? Do you think? Hmm. I can almost hear you shaking your head. <laughs> well, well, I mean, it was a very big controversy. We're talking like the U.S. president got involved, kind of big, you know. Yeah. Exactly. Um, even if just for Twitter, which I mean, that's his <laughs> prime way of involvement anyway. Wouldn't um, that have been crazy if like he tweeted what he said about ZTE and then on the bottom it's a tweeted from a ZTE? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's an interesting phone. Uh, the, the Accent 7 was this leaper hit that everyone keeps comparing this to. Yeah. Um, it, this is a very different phone. Like there are some definite downgrades uh, in terms of resolution. There's definite ground downgrade to 1080p. There's no headphone jack for a audio for an audio centric phone. Uh, there's the bottom firing speaker that's still you know for the purpose of stereo, but it's not the same as two front facing speakers. Um, to me, like the most interesting oh, and there's wireless charging and bigger battery. Those are nice things. But to me, the most interesting bit is what they're doing with the display. So uh, uh, to those 
listening who don't know what they're doing, they're including an RGB sensor uh, that would measure the color temperature and uh, just the general ambience of where you're in. And uh, then the, the display would be adjusted as to compensate for that color temperature in order to bring you the best viewing experience. Kind of like True Tone, I guess, but more focused towards a nice viewing experience, not necessarily an accurate one. Um, and then they're doing some frame interpolation so that if you play a 24 to 30 frames per second video, uh, it will fill in the, the frames to make it run at 60 frames per second. And that's- uh, uh, 60p uh, <laughs> footage. <Ugh. laughs> Well, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, it's going to look like a soap opera. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it's interesting. I, I don't think it's very useful. Like everything that I would want to watch at 60 frames per second, it's already at 60 frames per second anyway. And there's probably some vir virtual ar artifacts going on. But I do appreciate that there. That this is something we haven't seen included anywhere else for a kind of media-centric font. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you think that the full HD display is kind of... Uh... Knocking it back. Where do you land on? Uh, where do you guys land on screen resolutions? Do you immediately kind of scoff at the lack of quad HD? I mean, I'm currently using a uh, full HD phone, um, so yeah. I'm okay with not having super super high resolution. But at the same yeah. time, I, I can see that it's lower. If it's like without even having a second phone nearby to compare, I can still tell that it's a 1080p phone. Um, but it's not so much of an issue that's bugging me. Um, <laughs> if it's come, if the trade off comes with the right. Uh, savings and the right um, improvements elsewhere, it can make sense. Okay. I don't know whether this is a forward, backward, or lateral move from ZTE, because you have to remember the Axon 7 came out two years ago, and there was a gap year in between, and since then, the only time that ZTE has been in the news is because of this whole debacle in politics between the U.S. Yeah. and China on trade. And with this, this I mean, it, it's, oh, and the you have to be seen which we're uh, the Axon on M. <laughs> yeah. exactly. I love that no one I love that no one quite remembered. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I yeah. know. Well, Axon Mario would uh, would uh, know about that, yeah. I guess. Thank you for reminding me though. But yeah, like I was actually there for the freaking um, launch event which, ew. Mm. <laughs> complete memory hole <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah exactly uh but like even like but that was still like the, around the same time because that was uh what late last year right um and that was when this whole ginning up of the po political machine started so yeah. like there was a whole bunch of um, stuff and then uh, you know earlier this year the the bottom just fell out so at this point this is an exercise of rebuilding its um, shape we saw uh this uh in pre-briefs at ces and but we didn't know exactly what would happen beyond you know when we heard about the news that everything was you know going down the drain and that the import span was being issued yeah. so yeah. i think this is maybe a safe move a safe mm -hmm. move. I mean, at least it's AMOLED. Uh, at least there's a decent battery inside. And even with the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack uh, getting out of the game, um, well, I, I actually am not sure about that. But Bluetooth technology is all the better for me. Well, my, my my personal takeaway from this is uh, uh, it's 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 just it's just a hot take. You know, I keep looking at this photo of it, and uh, I want to say that's Jaime's hand, obviously. Um, it, it it's it's got some real G seven vibes to me, and I don't know how I feel about that personally. <laughs> like, it just doesn't really seem that much different to me as the way in the way that the Axon Seven did, and I, I think that that might. Uh, that might not that might not really work to their benefit in the end. <laughs> yeah. I, this is a freaking stupid comment, but I just wanted to highlight it. I'm sorry. Um uh Sean Vega Velez uh <laughs> in his Trump uses a ZTE Melania a Huawei and their son Baron a OnePlus. <laughs> The whole family of Chinese smartphones. Speaking of our comments, there, um, I love that the the live chat is kind of moderating itself a little bit. Uh, but I will answer this question on the air. Uh, Donnell Page asks, "What's the price of the Axon Nine? Well, only German availability is available right now, but um, it will go for six hundred forty nine euros, which translates to a little under a little under eight hundred dollars in the U.S. Oh, yeah, but who knows? Right. But who knows if it'll come in in the U.S.? That's the thing. Yeah. Well, that's another important part that I, I don't feel we have touched on is just the fact that there's a big price disparity between what the Axon yeah. 7 was. $400, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was part of why it was such a sleeper hit because it was so affordable. Exactly, yeah. I think, Steven, is that what you were going to touch on? Yeah, I actually had 
three things. That was one of them. Uh, second was that, I mean, yeah, I know a lot of people like the X Men Seven design, but it wasn't really a unique design. It it took heavily from the HTC design at the time. From mm-hmm. I, Apple's Fair. Design at the time. Oh come on, the triangles were like the best things about it, right? <laughs> triangles were very unique. I but will admit the, uh, that when I was talking about the design of the Exxon 7, that was what was in my head. Like <laughs> triangles. <laughs> yeah, but, but the actual back itself, that's very much HTC style design. Dual front speakers, mm-hmm. that was very much an HTC thing at the time. Um, it, it took heavily from it. Um, so it's, I'm not but those were good that. aspects that we yeah. wanted to see more. And the triangles right? made it memorable. To be fair. We remember, we remember the, the Exxon 7 triangles, not the dual M, the dual screen of the M, <laughs> you know? I was about to say, ZTE, take, a, take note. <laughs> yeah, no, so what I'm saying is I'm not too worried about it looking like other phones. That's not something that's... Okay, fair. LG, sorry, that ZTE is really losing compared to before. Um, what I was curious about, though, is how their quality control is going to be this time around. For the iPhone 7, I had multiple friends that had to return the phone after buying it because they ran into issues either with charging or with the speaker stop work, sorry, the microphone not working anymore, or a couple other things like that. And now their quality control team has had a, some time off, kind of. Uh, will they <laughs> come back the same way that they were before or better? Sure. And yeah, they, they, were, they had to fix the urine. Much. No, I was about to only say that they were, they were trying to fix a urinal uh, in place of uh, what they were. Yeah, sorry. I I, I was Move gonna on. go. I was gonna go with they got government. Uh, they got government induced PTO. So that was just like, <laughs> that was gonna be my thought. <laughs> In any case, we're gonna go ahead. This is gonna be our little bit of an intermission. Uh, let's go ahead and pay some bills in our break. This episode of the Pocket Now Weekly is brought to you by Jamf Now, a program to help you set up, manage, and protect your Apple devices. Do you use an iPhone or iPad? How about a Mac? Run a business that depends on these devices? Well, you should know that managing all of them can be easy no matter where your employees are based. Jamf Now keeps track of your digital inventory and lets you set out all sorts of data, credentials, and settings for each machine. You can even lock or wipe individual devices if you need to, and all of this is without any need for IT lectures. Best of all, It's pretty affordable. As a listener to the weekly, you can set up your first three devices for free. Each device after that is just $2 a month. Head to J-A-M-F dot, wait, yeah, J-A-M-F dot com slash pocket now to start up your free account today. That's J-A-M-F, Jamf dot com slash pocket now. Um, I'm gonna. We're gonna do this in vivo because, of course, YouTube is uh, such a beautiful uh, beast. Uh, could you pick up uh, the last bit again so that I can edit that uh, in? Oh, sure, sure, yeah. <clears throat> all right, live, live for all of our live. Uh, all right. Best of all, it's pretty affordable. As a listener to the weekly, you can set up your first three devices for free. Each device after that is just $2 more a month. Head to jamf.com slash pocket now to start up your free account today. That's jamf.com slash pocket now. Perfect. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> all right, awesome. Um, okay, so we have a couple of new faces on the show today. I do want to make sure we do a bit of a check-in um, and also just a bit of a uh, bit of an introduction. I mean, you, you guys have already been adding to such a great panel today, so let's start off with Mario over there. Why don't you give our viewers a bit of an introduction to yourself? Um, okay, well, uh, frequent readers of XDA probably know me. Um, I was editor-in-chief at XDA from, I think, 2015 to... Uh, up until early this year. So it was quite a run. Um, mostly specialized in uh, big technical articles and uh, I still write those for the site. Uh, beyond that, I'm a mathematics student at University of Minnesota, um, senior year, uh, doing my last year specializing in AI and machine learning. And um, I don't know, I have a really cool cat. I guess that's pretty much all there is to <laughs> And a broken S Pen, unfortunately. <laughs> and a broken S Pen, yeah. Well, you know, I, I'll get a new yellow... one in just a couple hours. Oh, there we go. You know what? That, 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 the, the funny thing is that broken S Pen, it kind of looks like when you snap a pencil in half. Like... <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> all right. Steven, uh, why don't you let the viewers know a little bit more about you? Yeah, I, um, I've been writing for XDA for a while. Joined back in 2016, um, almost exactly two years ago, actually. I think my first article was on like the 29th. Of August, yeah. Mm. Um, Congratulations on your August, second yeah. revival anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's been a fantastic run. Got to go. To, I got to, to go to Google I/O twice while with XDA. Nice. It's mm. uh, been a ton of fun. Outside of XDA, I'm a senior financial analyst for a venture capital firm. 
uh, the specialist in pharmaceuticals. Wow. Oh, hey. Yeah. <laughs> it got real Bio for a second there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, cool. Uh, Jules, how, how have things been since last week? So I'm Jules, and uh, I've been with Pocket <laughs> now for four years, and I don't know exactly what I'm doing here, but hey, I'm here. So um, <laughs> yeah, um, it's been a pretty fun week. It's been pretty hot. Uh, be, Bermuda highs, uh, be damned. I shall be rid of you soon because fall is coming. Are uh, you still? Yeah. You are you done traveling? Like, have, are you back now or? I'm back for the next few weeks. Uh, just got to head to New York for a show. Um, I think it's a show stoppers thing or something. But oh, okay. yeah, that's uh, pretty much it. Unless, uh, you know, Brandon needs to drag me down to Philadelphia for that <laughs> beer he owes me or something. <laughs> Fair enough. Brandon, if you're still in the chat, he's he wants that beer. All <laughs> right. So uh, one thing that I wanted to do as part of our check-in, or not really as our check-in, but in this little uh, mid-break that we have. Okay. All of the phones that we had in this past segment, in this last segment, before we get into sort of the bigger, like, I don't know, it's, it's hard to rank all of these, but that's what we're going to try doing. Um, so far... Out of everything that we've that we've we've looked at now, Jules has here that we want to do the best three. But um, what is something that you're really excited for, at least up until this point? I think that's where I'm going to put that. Hmm. Well, I'm excited for a more Android one. Um, I'm not one of those stock Android evangelists that you know, like there's a lot of that in kind of the reviewer community that it's like stock Android or bust. Um, but that said, I think it's a good fit for mid-range devices just because they're always having uh, the performance issues and the uh, um, uh, security update issues. And if you have mid-range devices that are updating faster than flagships, then that kind of put the onus on the uh, OEMs to really speed up uh, their security patches for their flagships themselves. So I'm excited yeah, for Android point. 1. Yeah. All righty. Um, how about you, Stephen? How, what are you excited for so far? What jumps right out at you? Uh, the part, the one thing that we've mentioned so far that I'm most excited for wasn't directly one of the stories itself. It was um, the focus on battery life. I mm -hmm. absolutely love large battery phones. Um, the majority of phones honestly don't get me through the day. Um, I, I'm really happy to see multiple phones focusing on battery life right now, and I hope it's a trend that continues. Yeah, fair enough. And then finally, Jules? <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty happy about the spread that we have today. And obviously, we'll be getting more as the weekend progresses. Uh, I, I'm just, again, I'm just happy that there is a lot of uh, options that we see here that are prominent, that are something that consumers can actually consider as uh, something that they can drive their lives daily with them, uh, as opposed to previous years where we've just gotten short shrift on mid-range phones or phones with like this little quirk to them. Like These are all saleable phones uh, at your stores or, or uh, your carriers or whatever. So um, pretty glad to see that happen in 2018. Cool. Uh, at, at least for me, I, I just am happy that we're not having ThinQ all over the place anymore. So I'm going to stick with the G7 <laughs> one. There. Um, but if they were going to go for a fitness slash active centric phone, let's call it the G7 Gains. Let's just do that. <laughs> Gains. G7 Keto. Oh, yes. G7 Keto. Exactly. Low carb lifestyle. Okay. <laughs> so what we have coming up in terms of gains is a new processor uh, coming from Huawei. See, my segue's on point today. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> really good. <laughs> All right. Oh, so boy. now yes. we have Huawei's just announced, like literally like I woke up to this email. Um, it, this is the Kirin 980. Uh, so what we have here is a brand new uh, processor. Now, the Kirin 970 has already gotten a lot of great press. It's, it's, it's well known for having wonderful performance. Now, the 980 just aims to really just sort of up the ante in that case. Uh, it's the first to feature ARM's Cortex-A76 cores. Uh, and also, there is uh, the Mali G76 GPU in terms of graphics. And I'm sure a lot of people are going to be really happy to check that out in terms of Fortnite and PUBG Mobile moving forward. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> There's also the dual NPU, uh, so they are going to be doubling down, in a sense, on their AI technology. And also, that dual NPU will also be used uh, on top of the ISP that is used for photography. Any thoughts? I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm going to go ahead and defer to our uh, much more technical people on the uh, <laughs> on the panel here. Thoughts on the Kirin 980? Whoa. Uh, <laughs> do I have thoughts? Um, it's This is a very interesting release for Huawei. Um, one of the reasons why we've seen Huawei kind of um, 
remain quote unquote behind Qualcomm, uh, even though they usually launch a little bit earlier and thus get a bit of an advantage uh, in terms of CPU performance, for instance. Uh, one of the reasons was because they were still behind in some areas. So for example, the one of the reasons why the Kyrene uh, 970 was behind uh, the current Snapdragon 845 in terms of uh, CPU performance is because that processor was built on TSMC's 10 nanometer as opposed to Qualcomm's 10 nanometer. Uh, I mean, sorry, Samsung's 10 nanometer. And also there's the the, the fact that that was running uh, A73 cores, which were older. Um, now though, we expect the next Snapdragon 845, um, A A A55, sorry, to have the uh, their cores, their Creole cores based on uh, A76 core. So will we be the same kind of core uh, baseline as the new current chipset? And also we expect it to be built on the same seven nanometer process. So there's gonna be more of a parity. The reason why we see Huawei touting a uh, something like 75 performance increase over the last generation uh, is precisely because they were a little bit behind and uh, something similar goes for the GPU. Um, so they're, they're coming up with very, very large improvements. And they also have some uh, their flex scheduler, which should allow those cores to be better adjusted to very to, to particular workloads. Um, and also handling multiple tasks, multiple tasks of different intensities at the same time. There you go. There you go. Um, and there's also the fact that they're doing something really interesting. For the first time, uh, we see a, a big middle little setup in the sense that we have two big powerful A70, A76 cores clocked that I think it was 2.6 gigahertz. And then we see another two A76 scores that are clocked lower. Um, uh, I believe it was. Uh, uh, it's still somewhere in the twos, right? Oh, yeah, okay. it was not. It was not one point ninety two gigahertz, and um, and th they also have different voltages. So they they are not just like lower clock. They're also operating at a different uh, uh, price uh, power ratio. Uh, sorry, uh, performance power ratio. Um, and then you have the A fifty five, which are the power efficient cores. So you have this structure setup. We have two powerful, two middle, which are still very powerful, and then the four efficient. And this is something new that's enabled by. Um, uh, Arms Dynamic IQ uh, system, which would w was promising this kind of level of flexibility in the core arrangements, and we're now really seeing this come to fru fruition. Um, so that's on the CPU side. GPU-wise, we also see a gigantic improvement. Uh, the the new Mali G76 has a, I think it was a 30% higher performance density. Which, if you compare if you compare the highest configuration of the Mali G72 which is the type of GPU that the Kyrie 970 was using with the highest of the G76, which is the kind of GPU that the 90 is using. There's a 25% peak performance uh, difference. However, um, the Kyrie GPUs, the, the, the Mali GPUs, uh, do not come all created equal. Qualcomm usually has the more powerful ones because they, they feature more cores and different frequencies, um, whereas Huawei has always opted for kind of a more middle of the road configuration that's never been as powerful. So that's kind of why we see uh, Exynos GPU performance be higher than the Kyrian GPU performance, but both still lower than the Qualcomm GPU performance, the Adreno. Uh, this time, because of the higher performance density, we have just 10 cores as opposed to 12 of last year's GPU, but they're much more powerful. And we've seen something like, uh, I think it was 46% improvement in GPU yeah. performance in something crazy like 175% per, uh, percent, uh, uh, power efficiency improvements, which is really what they needed because those GPUs yeah. have been just terrible for power. Yeah, the story I, I'm getting here is that there's been a lot of uh, fewer reference pieces being drawn in and more of the customization going on. I wonder if, uh, Stephen, you can uh, cover uh, some of the back end here in terms of uh, the MPU, in terms of uh, also the ISP. Um, yeah, so it, it's definitely going to be a big step forward for Huawei. For Huawei. Uh, hopefully, it'll find uses in the actual devices themselves. Uh, hopefully we'll see some more interesting camera stuff like they were doing with the uh, P-Series. Um, but the big question for it in my, in my case is what else are they gonna try and do with the phone? I think, sorry, with the processor. I think at this point, the Curian 980 is at a level where it's actually powerful enough to be used in Ultrabooks and stuff like that. I think we may actually be at the point where if, if they want to, they could put out a, a Curian 980 uh, base, uh, Chromebook, mm. or even a Windows 10 on ARM uh, Matebook, uh, which is Huawei's branding for their laptops. 
So it'll be interesting to see what it can do there and if they can integrate it with um, uh, Cortana and all that other stuff that way and Google Assistant on the Chromebooks. So I think there will be some definite uses for the MPU um, with all that extra um, machine learning processing that uh, is being used by the, those voice assistants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, still a, that's still a distinction that a lot of people have to make is that it's machine learning slash AI, whether or not they're the exact same thing. Uh, but having a dual NPU all up in there is like, you know, you have, you have a lot more processing power. And as far as the ISP is concerned, it's able to, uh, it's able to recognize so many more at a much faster rate, which is kind of cool. I mean, but that's, uh, that's something that we're going to have to see moving forward. I will say, though, that the, uh, the AI and the camera of the P20 Pro, it's still probably my favorite version of it, right. at least until now. The Samsung one's not bad, but even Samsung knows not to use <laughs> certain right. terms like AI yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they definitely kind of like put it in like the, the print of like their marketing materials. Like, oh, it's AI-based scene detection. Um, yes, exactly. Something something to keep in mind regarding AI is that ultimately the MPU um, and even uh, Qualcomm's DSP, uh, in terms of AI itself, they see very limited implementations. Now we saw Huawei kind of tout the uh, offline translation power through Microsoft back in previous releases, and we obviously see all this camera stuff, right? Um, but the truth is that ultimately it, the it, it's the, the responsibility of the developers and kind of the the, the spotlight is on them in order to actually begin utilizing these very powerful application-specific modules in these chipsets. Because ultimately, those bits in the processor, they're not doing something special per se. They're doing compute. They're doing mm -hmm. a very fast vector math and a, a matrix math. Um, they, they're doing a lot of operations per second. It's just more arithmetic. Uh, but they're doing they're doing it at a, at a faster rate. They're specialized for that kind of arithmetic, and uh, they're doing it at, at a much more power efficient point. So th that's the thing with this kind of whole AI MPU. Like I, I I'm very excited about this stuff. Obviously, like I want it to be <laughs> part of my future, right? But yeah. at the, at the present time, um, it's something that hasn't really materialized in a way that kind of makes the marketing points really resonate and really translate into something that uh, arrives to the end user experience and that people can actually be excited because something like a 30% boost in CPU frequency, it will have, uh, in non-CPU frequency, CPU performance, it will have some trickle down effect in your day-to-day -day user experience. It might be minimal, uh, it might not be depending on how it's implemented uh, with the software. But something like uh, double MPU, sure, you can you have two of those things. Uh, it's all parallel uh, math anyway, so you get pretty much a 2.2. They get I think they got 2.2x improvement. So you you basically double that that performance. Yeah, uh, for sure. But it's still like it, you're doubling performance of something that uh, is very fast in the few things that it's being used anyway, and uh, it's not being used for enough things as it is. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. I, I had a feeling that we were going to have a really good discussion on the 980 when we had you guys on. I'm glad to know that I'm right, <laughs> that I was right. I, was, I, I love the deep dive into stuff like that. Now, unfortunately, we are going to go from a super high-powered processor into one that might not be quite as powerful, the MediaTek Helio P60, <laughs> found in the latest Blue device. What we have here is Blue's, um, on, is this XI or 11 Plus? I want to say 11, yeah. right? Vivo 11. Yeah, they're 11th, it's yeah, their uh, 11th generation thing uh and you, you know, never the know specs, these days with these names <laughs> oh yeah but that's their 11th vivo thing going on at blue and it comes at a point where they've decided that there's been a whole bunch of damage that's been done to their brand over the course of the years they've started out with this unlocked phone mission and they've just been spamming <laughs> the industry for a lack of a better term in terms of giving out all the, the these models so uh, a little mm -hmm. statement from ceo samuel ohev zion here since we started this conversation Company in 2010, it was always our commitment to provide customers with the best devices at incredible pricing. Along the way, our obsession with fre uh, frequently launching new devices became excessive and eventually a detriment. There was no way we could support so many different models with software updates, after sales service, spare ports, accessories, and other important parts of the customer experience one would expect of a reliable smartphone brand. We all make mistakes. The important thing is to learn from them, improve, and move forward. That's what they've been doing there at Blue. Uh, 
Uh, and hopefully, this is just a touchstone. This is only a, a point at which we can observe from at this point, but um, it will have to see, we will have to see if they follow up and provide those uh, updates. So for this phone, uh, they're saying that March 2019, Android Pie is coming. Uh, they're starting off with 8.1. Uh, we'll have to see. It, 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 I know it's it's late, March March 2019 for Pi, but let's see if they can make this promise because the Blue Life One that I tested all the way back when I first came um, came along here did not get its scheduled lollipop update. So, oh. um, yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's something to look out for. Well, we're, we're jumping through a few of our last topics here. Just some quick thoughts. Uh, even if they are going to release fewer phones uh, in their cycles, are you excited at all about the latest one that they're <laughs> bringing out? No, no. <laughs> I mean, sorry. Uh, no. Like, but Blue has been just so off my radar. Um, and, I mean, we, we've written stories about Blue phones on the portal. I've edited many of them. Um, but it's not something I particularly care about. And I think that most in the enthusiast community don't particularly care about that either fair um, yeah this Steven? is how it is uh yeah i think this is a change that they have to make uh their whole thing beforehand before now was that they were making it easier to get those cheap chinese phones and have them localized to your current region and True. now you can get those cheap chinese phones directly um <laughs> easily for aliexpress and, so, and even on amazon so they need to take an extra step in that support life if they want to be able to keep rebranding those phones and um great point yeah mm -hmm. yeah um cheap chinese phone it's not oh sorry steven uh, quick oh, no, i'm just gonna say the um i think this one had six gigabytes of ram for 280. it's not too bad <laughs> definitely <laughs> that's not too the, bad uh, the four the six for 400 i think it was <laughs> yeah well we don't really have to expect that this next phone is going to be just a cheap chinese phone uh though that is a phrase that can be knocked around a little bit Xiaomi, it is a chinese phone <laughs> it is a chinese phone i'm, I'm not saying is. it's going to be cheap yeah. but definitely it, not is, a phone. Phone. it yeah. is yes exactly <laughs> um <laughs> it is uh well it depends to, on to your get, carrier right true yeah um, mm -hmm. <laughs> to get ahead of a lot of the announcements that have been coming out of IFA, um, I, I, it feels like a lot of these phones that now have sliders built into them, whether they're motorized or not. They, they all seem to be motorized, but I wish they weren't on motorized. Um, Xiaomi has announced, or not announced, but also uh, kind of just unveiled, maybe gave a bit of a peek into yeah. their next device, the Mi Mix 3. Now, we have, I, I think it's pretty safe to say we've all been fans of the Mi Mix line. It's done some pretty great things. It may not be the perfect device, but it does some things very right, and it's a memorable phone. Is this one going to be as memorable as the rest now that it has a rather Oppo Find 10 like design with that camera array that pops right out of the top? Any quick thoughts and hot takes on this one, you guys? Mm. Not popping the top? It looks like it's the whole back sliding, if anything. Yeah, yeah. no, it, it looks like the top display part is moving down yeah. to make room for the cameras. And I think, you know, in terms of, I know the whole uh, engineering part of this has been a big debate in terms of moving parts. I personally think that if there is a passive element, if you can move it without doing damage to uh, the internal mechanisms, uh, that's fine. But in, in, like, if you can feel it, if you're working against motors when you're moving yeah. it around, uh, I'm sorry, pass. Yeah, put the motors away. Like, give me back the sliders from like old. You know, like I think I think the um the magic one might be manual. Uh, the, the 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 honor announced also the the honor. I think yeah, I'm pretty sure I read that. Huh. I think I think I edited that. The um, magic two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, that, that that's the new thing, right? But the thing, but the thing is that the, um, I mean, if someone has consistently been doing this whole minimal vessel thing, right? Yeah, it's been show me with this particular line of phones. So I'm, oh, yeah. I, I, so I, I actually do want to see whether they can uh, keep outdoing themselves and now outdoing the competition because uh, the next is really impressive it's turned a lot of heads even if it's motorized and some people are doubtful about how long that will last and how um thick or how finicky it might be um it's interesting to see that that it's not it was not just a one-off that vivo did right it's it's something that other oems are adopting as well yeah it's not like a concept car right that <laughs> exactly yeah. even though that phone give... looked like one yeah Exactly, yeah. And I have to give Xiaomi a lot of credit because it's their phones uh, consistently, at least in my estimation as as, as my world as a, as a reviewer over the last five years, um, that it's, it, 
it seems like their phones are the ones that you just can't really, it's hard to just bash it outright, you know, like it's hard yeah. to do that. It, yeah. it always yeah. leaves a lasting impression. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's something that I really enjoy with that. Steven had a quick point. This, this seems like a much more sturdy uh, implementation of the pop-out camera than some of the others also. Um, I, I remember the Oppo M1 from a while back with the movable camera. People would constantly break it. Um, it's a worry for a lot of the other pop-out camera ones. This one seems like a more sturdy implementation of it. Yeah, definitely. All right, so as we're rounding out our stories for today, we have ourselves one final story about smartwatches, and it's about Wear OS. Wear OS apparently is going to be getting a bit of a UI update, and the question here is about whether or not this is going to actually give it the revival that it needs. Now, one thing that I do want to give a bit of a back-end thing, um, we are seeing processors getting uh, improved to the point where smartwatches could probably be more practical, last a little bit longer, on top of what might be coming from Qualcomm and Samsung moving forward, even though Samsung focuses on Tizen, what I mean is if the if the innards are getting better, will the software make all the difference? Uh, for example, the fact that in the UI, you can only swipe maybe just one time to get to all of the different items rather than having to go through the entire uh, entirety of the UI to get to your tasks. That's one thing that I think is great. Um, you also have kind of a Google Now feed over to the left uh, that will allow you to get straight to it, just like on a smartphone. So where do you guys what do you guys think about Wear OS uh, in general? And do you think that this is actually going to help it out? Hmm. Well, I use Wear OS uh, pretty much every other day. I actually have the um, the um, uh, Folster Skagen Folster phone uh, watch, which is really nice, and uh, and then I also use the Gear S2 uh, when working out. But to be honest, like it's to me, it's just an extended notification center. So I don't actually care much about all the other things that it can do. Um, that said, yes, more more hardware will enable them to do. Of more things in the sense that it's not that the all the processors were not strong enough to do it. This it will still be very basic interfaces, but they will be able to do it at a more efficient kind of uh, power consumption point. So they can do a lot more, I think, with the upcoming chipsets. And uh, I mean, I'm interested to see like whether if they really optimize the UI to make it simple and fast, whether I'll be using it for other things than just a notification center. True. Yeah, I think notification extension is like the main function of a smartwatch. How about you guys, Jules and uh, Steven? Yeah, same here. I, I'm not even using a uh, Android Wear or Tizen smartwatch right now. I'm still on a uh, Xiaomi Mi Band right now. Oh, same. The, I'm on the three. Uh, <laughs> oh, cool. Uh, yeah, cause right now they, or it's until now, the battery lists are too short for me. And I mean, having swiping on the main screen change the uh, change the display itself. Seems a bit of a waste of a uh, bit of a waste of a function. It, it, I hope mm. that now with the redesign, it will be a little bit more useful and work a little bit better, and maybe have a bit better battery life. Yeah, yeah. that's definitely yeah. the number yeah. one thing that we all need. Uh, final thoughts from yeah. Jules before we sign off. Yeah, I'm actually looking forward to uh, ditching Wear OS entirely and going with this new Nubia thing that was posted. I, I, well, I'm about to post it, but uh, it was the uh, like it's a flexible OLED strip that's taller than your wrist or like longer than your wrist uh, would have for usable space. And uh, it's interesting what they have going on. They're, they uh, announced it at IFA. There's a video. Uh, you should see it. Pocketnow.com. Uh, if not, you know, right after the live broadcast or uh, later on, if you are listening to this uh, offline. Ah, well, there you go. All right, well, we ended on some smartwatches, and on that wearable notes, uh, we're going to go ahead and call it on this show for this week. Remember that the weekly is just as much a conversation as it is a show. This one went a little bit longer because there was so much news coming out of IFA and even outside of IFA a little bit in the case of Xiaomi and Blue. But make sure your voices are heard either in the comment sections down below or by emailing us at pocketcast at pocketnow.com. You can also get into social media and tag the podcast on Twitter with the hashtag P and weekly. I want to give a big special thanks to Mario and Steven for joining us on the show today. Uh, we do miss you, Jaime, but you're probably eating a lot of curry wars and drinking a lot of beer, so we, maybe we don't miss you that much. <laughs> <laughs> As for our personal social media handles, Mario is at Tachyon Gun? Yeah. Yeah, that's the one. T A C H Y O N G U N. Steven is at, um, okay, so are the hyphens part of this handle here? 
Uh, no, it's confusing anything. Oh, it's just being broken apart. Okay, so S Z I M nine two. There we go. <laughs> That's S Z I M nine two over on Twitter. Point uh, Jules is, is of course found at Point Jules, and I am of course JV Tech T. I'll make it easy for you. I love tech and I love drinking some tea. A uh, quick shameless plug: if you're looking for a little bit of Note Nine coverage, I did do my review over on my channel at YouTube.com/slash Joshua Vergaro. So if you are interested in that, you can head over to my channel for that, and then look forward to the ultimate review coming down here at pocket now at youtube.com slash pocket now of course pocket now is also found on twitter facebook google plus and youtube in english and espanol where you can find more news on the daily and also at pocket now adario every weekday jaime's been doing a really good job doing that even though he's on the road we're also on on pocketnow.com for all your mobile tech needs we also would really appreciate reviews and ratings through google apple stitcher podcast or wherever you happen to be streaming us from without them we wouldn't be able to make this show for your eyes and ears for 320 weeks straight that just hit me just now <laughs> with that we will go ahead and call it on this edition of the weekly thank you so much for tuning in take care and we'll talk tech again next week